morning, saints. We welcome you again into the Red Room. We're a little bit late because we had to do things with dogs. And those of you who know us know that sometimes the dogs rule. We're going to open our time of worship today with a word of prayer. Now, if you would join me, saints, as we pray. Almighty Lord of all, we come before you this morning to worship you and to honor you. We come declaring that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You are the fairest of 10,000. You are the bright and morning star. You are the author and the finisher of our faith and the truth and the way and the life. You are the great I am. And we are gathering in our own places, offering our hearts and off, offering all that we have, asking, oh God, that wherever we are, you will enter in. For surely, we are the true temple, the true sanctuary of the Lord. So fill us, feed us. Oh Lord, you see the needs right now. We ask you to touch each person with your very presence. Send that precious spirit of comfort and strength. Oh, Lord, to those who are facing the very brevity of this life, that they may joyfully trust in the eternal life that beckons loved ones. Lord, send out now your guidance to those who are in the battle and who need your direction. Precious Savior, we plead for your supernatural touch, your divine touch to go and transform the people who are lost, but for you. And Lord, we lift to you all our first responders, our police, our firefighters. We ask, Lord, hedge them in. Keep them safe, O oh Lord. We pray for our leaders. Oh God, that you would direct their paths to take us where you would have us to go. We pray for your mercy over our country. And we pray as your people to forgive us our great and unfathomable sins. Spare us for the sake of your kingdom and stir up unprecedented revival. And we ask for all things always and every more evermore, Lord Jesus, in that name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus who taught us all to pray, our Father, who art Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name, name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven, heaven. and give, give us this day our daily, daily bread, and forgive and us our trespasses, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the eye is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As part of our worship today, we're going to begin with the chorus, Emmanuel. Thank you. 
I want to be a Christian in my heart. we look at other people and we say, boy, I'd like to be like that person. Or I'd like to be like that person. And they may be good people, but as children of God, we should want to be like Jesus. Let's sing that last verse again. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. see if we can get all the bells and whistles and things working and and uh, line up a few things with my bifogals which are no longer working properly and I'll turn the uh, I'll turn the uh, what do you call it on the computer down the brightness I guess so I don't know <laughs> anyway which does not help my vision any by the way so here we are and uh, maybe maybe you're getting a little less glare today because it's kind of a cloudy day outside and, and all our leaves have come out on this side of the house so we're not getting quite so much brightness in from this, this side of the house. Oh, and we are sure glad to have you here. Sure glad to have you here. And uh, I still don't have a printer that works so we're going to go with the, with the laptop and do the very best that we can. It's kind of a challenge for me this thing. 
Uh, but it's it's all right. It's all right. I tried to. Um, well, I don't have a mouse now. Where's my mouse? Lord have mercy. I'm trying to make it big enough that I can see with all that's going on with my eyes, which aren't, uh, they're not doing what they should be doing here. You have your mic on. I don't have my mic on. Is it on? No. No, no, no. Oh, my. There we go. Sounded like we had a pig caught under the fence there for a minute. That's no good, is it? No. No, indeed. I'm going to have to figure out a way to put the mouse up here somewhere. But anyway, we'll do that. Tomorrow, Scarlett. <laughs> yeah. I wish you'd have seen the look on his face. What? What? We can't do anything now. <laughs> no, we really can't. Although, one of the fun things about live, one of the things I enjoyed when I was a child, and most of the programs that you saw on TV were live, was waiting for the, the mistakes, the accidents, which occurred with some regularity on some of the shows. And I enjoyed it. And, but they pulled it off a lot better than we do. We get flummoxed, and then that's kind of it. <laughs> but we're certainly glad to be back with you again, sharing a time for the Word. And uh, we pray that you benefit from it. We trust that the Word of God never returns void, so that if what I have as a message doesn't touch you, the word of God in and of itself will touch you. Yes, well, all of a sudden, my printer that doesn't work is showing up on the screen in front of everything, and it will go away. That's all right. The devil is a liar. Our scriptures this morning are from Matthew. Chapter 10, verses 40 and 42. And we've been, the last couple weeks, delving into this chapter. And this wraps up this chapter. So hear the word of God. This is from the Amplified Bible this morning. The scripture says, He who receives and welcomes you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives and welcomes a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous, honorable man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones, these who are humble of rank and influence, even a cup of cold water to drink because he is my disciple, Truly, I say to you, he will not lose his reward. This is the inerrant word of the living God. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Now, we've been talking, as I said, the last few Sundays about the sending out of the 12 and then eventually the sending out of the 70, 72. And we're going to wrap up this uh, chapter with the last few verses that are, I think, frankly, quite uh, a direct challenge to all of us who are disciples of Christ. So what we have here in these few verses is Matthew relating a commissioning speech that Jesus is making to his disciples. And he has finished a long series of teachings about what it means to be a follower of his, and now he's sending them out to do his work themselves. And you got to try to picture these men who Jesus called, not from a religious life, but from so many different places and professions. Some are related. Some have been both business partners and competitors, fishermen by trade and business owners and employers of other workers. One is considered to be a traitor to the Jews. One has been a student, Simon the Zealot, Zealots engaged in politics and anarchy, attempting to overthrow the Roman government. He may have been a politician, oh, the horror, a revolutionary. Can, we can easily imagine what he'd be doing if he were living here now, but for 
God. God. He was completely changed. His allegiance was completely reshaped by Jesus. Some of these disciples are bold, some brilliant, some soft-spoken, and at least one we know is decidedly skeptical. So this is a seriously diverse group of individuals, and all of them have given up their own immediate lives to follow this teacher, this rabbi, this amazing man who they have come to believe is the Messiah. Now their understanding of what that means isn't clear yet. But their devotion to Jesus is undeniable. And they've traveled with him and eaten with him and sacrificed for him and sat at his feet. And they have learned and learned and learned. And he's healed and he's preached and he's performed miracles. And he showed them a world view that they never had seen before. And he talked about the kingdom and about their part in it. And so now, after all this, Jesus d has done what all good teachers and leaders must do. He sends them out. He commissions them to go and to tell the good news. And more than that, Jesus is telling them, go and do what you've seen me do. I'm giving you my authority to do these things. Oh, Jesus had warned them that it would be hard, and, and you might remember that from the last week, that people would refuse to believe, that people would rebuke them and make fun of them or even have them beaten or arrested. But after all that, all those warnings, all those instructions, he speaks the words that we hear in our scriptures today, that when people did actually receive them as they journeyed, as they spoke, as they told about a kingdom that was at hand now that was different from anything they had ever known. When people did that, they would actually be receiving Jesus. Jesus is telling them when they accept you and what you have to offer, they're accepting me. When they see you, they're seeing me. Now think about that for just a moment. People would see them. And when they accepted the truth of what they had to say, they would see Jesus. And then he said, when they see me in this way, they're seeing my father. See them and see Jesus to see God. Now surely you've heard someone say, maybe you've said it yourself, I, I can't believe in a God that I can't see. And, and to be fair, haven't we all thought at one time or another, well, boy, howdy, this faith stuff would well, sure be a lot easier if, if I'd actually gotten to meet Jesus, to step under that anointing. What a difference it would have made to actually see Jesus, to sit at his feet, to hear his teaching, to see his miracles. But in these verses, we begin to realize something critical to our faith and to our calling. That in spite of a watching, uh, in spite of watching a world that now seems clearly to be in chaos and, and suddenly even sometimes offended at things we can hardly wrap our minds around. Offended now at statues of Jesus because they look some of them like a European Jesus instead of a Middle Eastern Jesus. Does it matter? See, we don't really need statues 
to tell us what Jesus looks like. People of faith have never needed those things. Oh, it's marvelous, I think. I'm an art lover, a history lover. It's marvelous to try to capture what our hearts tell us is true in art, in stained glass windows, and even in statues. But those are man's feeble attempts to portray the supernatural within the limits of the natural. To be offended by that is, to my mind, a little bit bizarre. But Christians don't look at all this artwork and think, oh, wow, that's exactly what Jesus looked like. We don't rely on those things because when we stop and we think and we consider, we realize we have already seen Jesus. We have a relationship with Jesus. Now, I can assure you that I saw Jesus in my grandmother. She lived a life that honored his teachings and his compassion. I saw a different side of Jesus in my friend Barb, who mentored me years ago, and she was bold enough in her faith to call me out on some things. You know, there was a time, believe it or not, when I wasn't quite as saved as I am now. <laughs> uh -huh. That's true. Now let's call Barb again. Yeah, well, we could talk about some of your stories, too. Never mind. Uh -huh. Never mind, he says. <laughs> Come on, preach, sister. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do some preaching. I, I saw Jesus about 30 years ago now. When I went to a little Methodist church with no other reason, for no other reason than because my daughter was singing a solo there. And during that service, I realized that right there, preaching the word with such power and with such truth was the real deal. Now, I got to tell you, you, there's a lot of pastors who are great preachers, but they aren't always the real deal. This guy was. He preached Christ. He offered Christ. And with that came an undeniable anointing that allowed you to see Jesus. And it shaped and changed my life. And then I ended up taking a whole new look at who Jesus was. I came to understand that this Jesus was who he said he was. And I had to do something about it. And I did. Now, none of these people were perfect. But they revealed the perfect one in their actions, in their words, in their lives. They opened the door to the perfect one. They reflected Christ. The truth is, most of us have known someone or several someones that have been that kind of model for us. And the other truth that we find in these verses is that we, who are servants of the Most High God, who are disciples, and who, through the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, are heirs and co heirs of the promise in Christ. We're called to be just as clear a picture of Jesus as these first apostles were called to be. How's that for some pressure? Because aren't we stepping out always aware of our shortcomings, our flaws, our sins, our mistakes? Jesus is telling his disciples in this scripture, and, and are we not his disciples? You are the opportunity for the world to see me. And when they take 
what you have to offer when they hear, what you have to say when they receive, what I am giving you to take to them. When they do that, they'll be receiving me. And then Jesus says to them, and if they will receive and welcome a prophet because he is a prophet, they will get a prophet's reward. And if they receive a righteous man because he is a righteous and honorable man, they will receive that level of a reward. Hey, st stop a minute and let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Jesus is sending these men out with the authority to do what Jesus did. They are empowered with an anointing and a power that has its origin in Jesus Christ. It's not dependent on who they are. Praise be to God. They aren't prophesying apart from what Jesus has gifted them with. They aren't healing apart from what Jesus has empowered them to do. They aren't standing on their own honor, but walking in obedience to Jesus, who is our true righteousness. So when someone receives them, when someone has the ears to hear and the eyes to see the truth in the message that they're bringing, they will receive a reward for their faith according to what they have welcomed. They will see in these disciples Jesus. Jesus in these instructions are reassuring these men that he will most certainly be with them and working through them. And the same, Jesus is saying the same thing to you. And lest you falter, lest you say to yourself, well, yes, but, but they were different or more special or they had more to offer than I could possibly do. Know that you're wrong. We are, in fact, or should be more able to step out, emulate the apostles than the actual apostles. Because we have a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And until Jesus died and sent that spirit, what these disciples were working under wasn't yet theirs to access, to, uh, to properly engage. It was totally dependent on the name and the power of Jesus Christ for that time of service. And as Jesus sent them out, he said at the last, be aware. Anything that is done, even the smallest of acts that are done, the smallest service that is done as a disciple with the heart of a servant will result in a reward because someone will be seeing Jesus in you. That is our call and our privilege and our gift to the world. Now, who will see Jesus in you? For whom will you be Christ's representative in the world? Right where you are, in the places where you already find yourself. Because you have been sent out. As surely as the 12, as surely as the 72, because you have taken Christ and become his disciple. Who will see Jesus in you? Who 
will see God in you. Statues and artwork and stained glass, they all have their place. But when people see Jesus in us, as imperfect as we are, because Jesus pushes past that. When people see Jesus in us, they're seeing a face that's flesh and blood. They're seeing the tears that you shed or the smile that you smile. They're seeing Jesus' tears. And his smile. When people hear your prayers or your laughter, they can hear Jesus at the same time. When you embrace them and sorrow with them and hold them and, and feel their pain, they feel the love that Jesus is pouring out of you. That is is the promise. That is a reality of a God who loves them so much that he sent his only son so that they might have eternal life. If they will just receive him. That is the gift that you have already been given. It is the gift that you must take out. You must go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. As Jesus commissioned each one of these, Jesus commissioned you to do the same. Go and tell the good news. Amen. 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 hand over the antique piano stool. Oh, you have that last for me. Yes, I have that for you. Thank you, sir. And you can all you can all say happy birthday to Harry. It was his birthday yesterday. He's moved into a brand new, exciting, and wonderful decade. Get it, rub it in. Uh -huh. I'm excited. Yeah. We went to visit my daughter yesterday. Uh, two of her kids uh, have gone through graduation, and we wanted to celebrate with them. And I was talking with Ashley, and I said, uh, you can still call me the old timer. She's called me that for many years. And my daughter was standing near me. She said, Daddy, there are a lot more than her, a lot more than she that call you the old timer. Yeah. I knew that. Uh-huh. You knew that. Yeah. Kind then of. there was another pastor there. And she said, Harry, how old are you? And I told her, I said, I'm 70. <laughs> and she got this grin on her face. She said, I'm only 65. <laughs> uh-huh. And she only looks 50. God I'll love her. You. She looks yeah. good. God bless her. Oh, she looks marvelous. Yeah. The Lord has preserved her. Perhaps. Wait, wait, wait. You don't. <laughs> the Lord did not preserve me? I didn't say that. Did I say that? Did you hear me say that? I think you need to sing the next song. I'm going to look up this next song in big print if I can find it. If you <laughs> give me a minute. That's all right. Lord, I want to be a Christian. No, we sang that. Oh, we sang that. I get confused. I now know. I have a reason to. Well, we can blame it on that, can't we? It'll, uh, it'll be a life from the gates of hell, but we can blame it on that oh, for listen. right now. Lord uh, of the dance. We dance in the morning. Mm-hmm. Mostly on the inside. Uh-huh. <laughs> Are you ready? I'm ready, babe. I danced in the morning when the world was begun. I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. I came down from heaven and Would not dance and they would not 
Someone that was there yesterday at the graduation party had mentioned a song that I've known for many, many years, Jesus on the Main Line. And we're going to do this for her, for everyone who wants to hear it. Praise the Lord with us. And I'm going to mute myself right now. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. But he's paying attention. Yeah. Last week we said, he, we noted that if even a sparrow drops to the ground, he knows it. That's right. He knows all the intimate details of who you are and what you really need. Even down to the hairs on your head. And probably the hairs in your beard. I'm not sure. That, that was a good effort to save yourself. Was it? That was good, yes. Well, I'm just saying. Uh-huh. Now, God is faithful. Amen. God is good, and there's nothing wrong with asking him for anything you want. So long as you know, God will do what God will do. Yep. 
because he knows the end from the beginning. And he's got the last word. He has the last word. Absolutely. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord let his peace, that peace that passes all understanding, settle on you. And the Lord's favor fall on you. fire from the Holy Spirit ignite you and fill you up celebrate the Lord today honor him praise him pray to him go out and tell the good news knowing he is with you go saints and be blessed in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Creek don't rise.